Hello, I'm here with Professor James K. Galbraith, who holds the Lloyd M. Benson uh, Government uh, Chair at the LBJ School of uh, Public Affairs. Jamie, good to be with you this morning. It's a pleasure, Mark. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you today about uh, a, a book that you wrote a, a few years ago, uh, The Predator State. Um, you, when you wrote it, I jokingly said to you, you've raised the elephant in the room, which uh, uh, post-Keynesians in particular don't like to talk about, which is, um, we talk about the importance of having government uh, having an important role in mobilizing uh, resources for a broader public purpose. Uh, what do you do when the state itself becomes an agent of, of predatory capitalism? And I think that's the challenge you raise in your book. It is in part the challenge I raise in the book, but I think there's actually a broader one that lies behind it, which is to try and get across the point that the modern economy is not one where you can actually separate out government from the market and treat them either from a right perspective or a left perspective as separate and opposed entities. The markets that we have, what we, what we refer to very casually as markets, only exist in the modern world because of the public structures that we have put in place around them. Otherwise, they would have collapsed and we would never be in the modern uh, state of economic and technical organization that, in fact, we, we reached. And that's true at the level of technology. It's true at the level of production and distribution. It's true at the level of social insurance. Everything we do is organized around large public institutions. And what I, the argument of the book was then that what the problem that arises is when you get a political uh, control of the public organizations, which is intent upon exploiting them for private profit. Right? And there, there you have, and, and once you see that, you see that this is a pervasive problem. At the time, this was the late years of the Bush administration, it was just a simple description of the American government that it was a coalition of um, major private sector corporate interests, whether you're talking about mining and uh, energy and their views on the environment, or whether you're talking about the media and the problem of political control, or whether you were talking about predatory finance, which was the driving force behind economic activity at that moment. Yes, in retrospect, it, it turned out, it was a description, but it turned out to be quite prescient because you could have easily written the book in 2009 and come to exactly the same conclusions. Well, once you have, once you have I think, a clear structural view, then, of course, the patterns of behavior uh, uh, become much more comprehensible. So, yes, sure. Now, Bill Janeway wrote a book a, a few years ago, and he described the importance of the state in terms of fostering innovation, uh, in, not only in terms of, you know, say the internet, uh, but also um, the earlier railway booms, the canal systems. Historically, as you've pointed out many times, and the, the New Deal uh, played a very, very important role in terms of um, fostering infrastructure, as did Eisenhower under the, uh, uh, the highway program. But in the last few years, as you've pointed out, the, the role of government has changed. So how do we get it back? How do we get the state back to this area where it, it, it mobilizes resources for these great, broader public purposes? The important thing, this is actually a, a concept that goes back to an earlier uh, vision of economics and the life of my family, uh, mm -hmm. is, is the, the, the notion of countervailing power. It cannot be the case that the state is run by the same interest that the state exists to uh, regulate. Uh, it simply it can't be umpire and player, in other words. It can't be both. Well, it can't be. It, mm -hmm. it, the umpire cannot be owned yes. by mm -hmm. one of the teams. Yeah. That is simply a, a very basic principle, and that is the principle that we are massively violating. So one has to have uh, a state structure which has as its purpose and its authority, the, let's say, something that we'll call a higher public purpose. Uh, and if you don't have that, it's not that, the, that, that, that business will run free, it's that business will collapse. And again, the financial debacle is a clear example of this. There was a systematic process and the, the, the trio of, of, of Bill Black phenomena, mm -hmm. deregulation, desupervision, and decriminalization of financial activity meant that you got uh, the takeover of the system by some of its worst, most aggressive, most predatory players. When the unsustainability of that became clear, 
basically in August of 2007, to everybody the system started to crumble. Nothing could stop it. And what we've learned in the six years since is that it doesn't recover. And you have a major impairment of core institutions. You have to restructure them in a very serious way and reestablish norms of behavior. And if you haven't done either of those things, and we clearly haven't, then you can't expect those institutions to go back and function uh, as they did 30 or 40 years ago. Not, it's not going to happen. And what's the first step? Well, I guess the first step would be obviously reestablishing the rule of law. Um, I, I think what we have done has rewritten the rules, uh, and that was what Todd Frank did to a certain degree, it, but in a very symbolic way. So no, actually, I don't think that uh, restating the principles of law is uh, the, 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 the key thing. Enforcing, enforcing, a, enforcing yeah. actual yeah. laws would be a very useful first step. Uh, but beyond that, you have institutions which are, have grown to a scale where it's vastly excessive in relation to what they actually do in the economy. Uh, they are a deadweight charge on every other form of business activity. So it's basically redistribution within the business sector from businesses that might actually employ people, provide jobs, provide useful services, to institutions that were only really function as intermediaries and as clients for the extremely wealthy. And they should be, they should have been restructured downsized, broken up, in t reassigned new missions, replaced with parallel institutions that uh, can perform functions that they're not willing to, to do. An entire restructuring of this sector is, I think, the step that's required. It, well, there's precedent for it. it. This is what happened in the post-war period in, uh, in, in Europe, in Japan, uh, and laid the basis for uh, the, uh, the the thirty glorious years and so forth. It, it, Although uh, the, the 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 worry, of course, is that um, one hopes that you don't need a an event the magnitude of either the Great Depression or another war to ensure that, that sort of restructuring takes place. Well, except for the fact that we have the institutions that were created in the New Deal yeah. uh, and reinforced in the Great Society, we have recreated the conditions of the Great Depression. Now, those institutions. Roosevelt and Johnson in the United States and the post-war uh, reconstruction in Europe and Japan have protected us from the kind of uh, calamity that uh, human calamities of the early 1930s in most places. Not everywhere, even in Europe. You can see the human calamity in Greece. It's there in front of your eyes if you go. Uh, so we are in the same conditions with respect to the private economy uh, that I think characterize the 1930s, we just don't feel the um, uh, the social and human consequences, especially in the United States, nearly so acutely. And why not? Because the public sector in the U.S. replaced at least 70 percent and maybe up to 90 percent of the income that was lost. That's what happened. We had expansion of Social Security, disability, unemployment insurance. One can go down the list of things, but if you add it all up, and the Congressional Budget Office did, uh, the other day for, I think, the bottom 60% of the population, the income losses were relatively small. What was great was they lost their jobs, we lost the production, they lost the value of their houses, the value of their pensions. But the current income, okay, that was, that was the thing that, that where, where we were able to hold the line, and that was a big difference between now and the 1930s. And in fact, you've uh, spoken out a lot about this and, 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 and indeed uh, gone against the, the current trajectory of a lot of policies, which is quote-unquote entitlement reform, which has been code for cutting back on those very institutions which uh, prevented a, a recurrence mm -hmm. of Great Depression too. Uh, I've seen you on many shows and interviews and indeed written articles talk about expanding both Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that, that the crisis provided an opportunity for the historic opponents of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, other core insurance programs to take a, mount, a major attack on them. And that uh, happened. I, I think it's fair to say that for the most part it didn't succeed. Uh, 
so that these institutions remain intact. I think the crucial point I've been trying to get across is that without these, those institutions, and if they had been privatized or weakened significantly, our ability to buffer the crisis would have been far, far less. These turned out to be the core supports of, um, of, of, of US uh, society and, and, and economic activity. Um, it is a clearly a, a gross misreading of the situation to accept that these should be treated as though they're ostensible balance sheets, particularly spread out over many years into the future or some sort yes, of I, crucible, crucible of policy. I saw you on CNBC and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the question of social security's uh, sustainability mm -hmm. came up and, uh, and the, the question of course was, well, where would you cut in order to save money? And you challenged the whole premise of the question. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, well, it's fair to say that my questioners uh, found uh, the, that, they, that this stepped outside of the frame that they were comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, well, of course, well, well, why don't you elaborate on what you said on that, uh, that program for those that didn't uh, have the, the benefit of seeing it at the time? Mm. Well, the, uh, the premise, of course, of, 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 of these financial talk shows is always uh, the talking points of the moment that mm. come are handed down by, by, by places like the Peterson Foundation. They, are, uh, 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 they reflect a very conventional view, uh, which in the, at this particular moment was that Social Security is financially unsustainable. And I simply pointed out that financial unsustainability has nothing to do, is a concept that has nothing to do with the programs of the government of the United States. Uh, and that what we should look at is the, fa is the fact that Social Security provided a, uh, uh, a, uh, a buffer and a stabilizing mechanism for the entire American population. Uh, and that, it, from that point of view, a movement to make it more uh, adequate, particularly uh, in places where at the moment it's not, would be the movement in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And of course, this baffled them completely. But these are people who, who uh, to be charitable in their life experiences, have, so far as one can tell, absolutely no content, contact uh, with the, let's say, 60% of the elderly population of the United States for whom Social Security is the sole source, a major source of their income. So they don't really know much about what life is like uh, in, the, in, the, in the country as well. And at the same time, uh, taking it from Social Security to Medicare, you have been uh, amongst those who have advocated uh, not only uh, um, uh, increasing the benefits, but expanding Medicare, um, bringing it down to, uh, say, people, it, make, it, make its eligibility to, to people at age, age 55. That was a, an argument I made that should be done as an emergency, should have been done as an emergency measure in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. I think that particular policy idea has been superseded by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and one of the re things that actually uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see as a consequence possibly of the ACA, is that it does make it easier for people who are uh, older and who uh, have, who are hanging on to their jobs only for medical insurance uh, to leave the labor force, which is something that the idea of bringing Medicare down to 55 would have also accomplished. So if one has a situation where uh, this is a, it turns out, and I think part of the reason the ACA has encountered such savage resistance is that medical insurance has been a major hold that employers have over their workers. Uh, incomes are easily replaced. Health insurance, particularly if you have a previous condition and who at the age of 55 or above doesn't have something or at least worry that they might have something, uh, then you are pretty well tied to that job and you have to t put up with a great deal more than uh, otherwise. And so if you can get insurance on the exchange and you have some financial reserves, you are a freer person as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And that's a, a, a great benefit to the working population. And you can understand why some of the employer population isn't happy about it. In fact, one of the arguments that struck me the most in the, in the, in the predator state was when you went on to the issue of, uh, of health insurance. And you talked about how much more efficient Medicare was than any uh, private health insurance program. Well, Medicare uh, provides a universal health insurance for the population 65 and over who are otherwise very substantially uninsurable. Uh, the private insurance never reached that population and uh, essentially never could because as a 
elementary biological fact, we don't live forever. Uh, so the existence of Medicare made it possible for private medical insurance to be economically viable for the younger population. Why? Because you're not betting on whether or not person X is going to get sick. That's not really the insurable proposition. The insur everybody gets sick. The insurable proposition is, will person X get sick before uh, they reach the magic age when the insurance company no longer has to pay out? Mm -hmm. At 65, that becomes the government's problem, not the, and that's insurable. Right? That's a bet that makes private health insurance economically uh, uh, feasible proposition. So the whole structure, it's a very nice example, by the way, of mm -hmm. how a public institution makes it possible for private institutions to grow that would otherwise not have existed. The last question I'd like to ask you about it relates to an article you wrote uh, about a year ago in regards to um, uh, increase in the minimum wage, well beyond what uh, is being advocated now. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I have been, for a long time, an advocate of raising the minimum wage uh, at the federal level to $12. Uh, I think uh, that would put, uh, would give a raise to approximately just a little under 30 percent of the existing American workforce and a substantial raise to people at the bottom. Uh, it would be a very significant transfer of income from higher from profits to wages and from uh, toward the lower end of the uh, of, of the wage spectrum it would help uh, it would set standards for businesses in that area uh, in that's in that part of the labor force which they're presently not required to meet uh, and the whole effect would be a very favorable restructuring of economic activity customers uh, at the low end would have more money businesses that can afford to pay the uh, the minimum would see more business, and others would have to adjust. So that's, I think, uh, a, it, 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 there, it's a it's a proposition which is not only very popular as a political uh, um, matter; it's also a very uh, uh, significant structural reform. And we have seen tests of this, for example, in the United Kingdom, which introduced a minimum wage in 1999 and has been raising it. We have, I think a fairly good test of all of the scare stories that economists have been throwing at the minimum wage uh, for many decades. Uh, and That will actually increase unemployment. Uh, maybe that's, that, you know, the ABRA will rise and yep. ABRA will come down. Uh, the, uh, and the, the fact is, so far as I can tell, it has become practically non-controversial in the UK, so that even the Tory party, even the conservatives, have basically said, well, gee, we tried this and it seems to work and we are in favor of it. It is, in addition, from the standpoint of the political climate in the US, a very uh, 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 promising thing, because first of all, it has no budget impact. Uh, it's not spending federal money. Uh, so, and in fact, it would increase uh, Social Security payroll tax revenues. So from the, if you're concerned about the budget deficit, you should be in for it. Um, and it has there are important arguments which have been made, notably by my friend Ron Unz out in California, uh, who's tried to organize a referendum on the subject, uh, that appeal very strongly to, uh, to, to people of conservative instinct. Uh, and I think that he's right about it, that it would, for example, and this is, I think, something which is also important for a working population, it would make it less attractive to bring people over the border simply to exploit them at low wages. Because you, if you're obliged to pay a decent wage, why not hire someone who is going to be a stable employee. That strikes me as a very sensible, correct argument. So, and it would also reduce the enormous sums that flow from federal welfare programs, food stamps, for example, to low wage employees, for example, in the fast food industry. All positive developments. In California, we are hopeful uh, that uh, the legislature, which has a democratic supermajority, will simply take this up and enact a higher minimum wage. Uh, there's a bill to do that, to put it up. Is, they just moved it up to 10. They can move it up to 13. California's got a high cost of living. $13 is not excessive in California. It would set a standard for one-tenth of the U.S. economy that would then, I think, within a very short period of time, become the goal to, to match for the rest. And we would see, I think, this is a, an area where one can have a significant uh, effect on the whole structure of the U.S. economy, one could do it quickly, uh, and one can do it 
in the present political environment, grim and miserable as mm -hmm. that is. And on that positive note mm -hmm. of bipartisan comedy, I'm going to end it. Uh, Jamie, thanks as always for uh, chatting to me. It's always great to see you, and um, I hope we can follow up again in the that's, future. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Always fun to be here uh, at INET, which is an exceptionally important endeavor.